Hello, everybody. This is our new episode of Roundtable Conversations, and I'd like to remind everybody our mission and purpose. Our mission and purpose is to spread the spirit and technique of listening to alternate points of view in conversation. We want to practice and set an example on how you can create a shared common pool of meaning in conversation, even if you're speaking with people who have a polar point of view, where all sides listen to each other, uh, listen to each other's values, listen to each other's concerns, share them, and then in turn, where they share their own values and concerns. Um, in order to help facilitate this uh, beautiful spirit, then we have a couple of rules that uh, help us converse in such a manner and to facilitate quality listening. The first rule is all participants of the round table are equal in importance. So the second you sat around this round table, it doesn't matter how rich you are or how poor you are, how black you are, how white you are, if you're a female or a male, whatever your gender is, whatever your profession is, if you're a doctor, if you're an electrician, if you're a prostitute, whatever it is, your point of view, your perspective is just as valid. We're all equal here around the round table. Um, the order of speech is going to be... Um, we lost somebody. It's going to be Allison, then Isohe, then uh, Veronica, and hopefully Julie will have Buck on board, and then we'll we'll find where to place her. Back with us, Julie? Yep, it's not happen. It's okay. I was saying one person speaks at a time, so we don't barge into each other's speech. When one person finishes, I'll call the next person out to speak. You will be speaking after Isohe. And in order to give everybody time to speak as well, then I'm going to set a timer for two minutes whenever each speaker starts speaking. Two minutes of full, unadulterated uh, uh, speech is a lot of time really to express yourself. Uh, you'll hear the timer ring in the end. Uh, if you have hear the ring, then you probably should wrap it up. Okay, so to give everybody enough time to speak, it's going to be about 10 minutes per round. We want to put in, you know, at least six questions. Um, when not speaking, participants are focused on listening. This is a tricky one. It's very, very difficult. They don't teach it in school. So usually we're focused on thinking what I'm going to say, uh, how the person speaking is wrong. Uh, did they feed the cat this morning? And the, our purpose is to actually try to actively listen, actually try to understand, uh, the person who's speaking, understand his point of view, uh, logically, emotionally. I don't have to agree with him. But I do have to strive my best to actually be listening. And the last but not least our rule that we have is that we always add to the common pool of knowledge. We don't negate. We don't argue. So if a speaker, for instance, says something that I consider absolute uh, bollocks, is that what you say over there in the UK? <laughs> you got it. If, if they say the sky is green. And I know with absolute certainty the sky isn't green. It's, it's blue right out there. I know it's blue. So rather than bursting into his speech and correcting him, which obviously I'm not going to do because we speak in turn, but even when it's my turn, rather than saying that person is wrong, he's full of baloney, that's not true, rather than doing all of that, I simply share my point of view. I think that this guy is blue. That's it. I simply skip the whole part where I point out what I disagree with and I simply present my own point of view. I think people are smart enough to be able to differentiate different points of view, we don't have to point it out to them. I can call out somebody if I agree with them. I perfectly agree with what Allison said about the sky. It's definitely blue. And et cetera, et cetera. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Rock and roll. I have the great honor to be the host for you lovely ladies today. So every round I will present a question and then I'll shut up. And then I'll... Um, if you guys will be speaking, I'll call out the order of speech. Um, I'll try not to interject at all with anybody until it's uh, the circle goes around and it's my turn again. I'll summarize and go to the next question. I will only interject in case somebody needs a mild reminder about the rules of the round table. Again, everybody are equal in importance. One person speaks at a time. When not speaking, we're focused on listening. And we always add to the common pool of knowledge. We never negate and we don't argue. So the topic of today's roundtable conversation, should prostitution be legal? Our speakers today are the wonderful 
Alison Bass and Veronica Monet were presenting the perspective that prostitution should be legal. And the amazing Julie Bindle and Isohe Agatise, I hope I've enunciated that right, right. were presenting right. the perspective that prostitution should not be legal. We're going to clarify the different at times polar perspectives people have on this very, very important issue. Hopefully, we'll also find commonalities and create a shared common pool of meaning that everybody can draw from. And possibly, we might even find new uh, third solutions that nobody's thought about before. Uh, I'll be using the definitions prostitution and sex work interchangeably and criminalization and prohibition interchangeably. Uh, we're going to delve into the nature of sex work, the darkest sides of abuse and danger in this trade, the different legal frameworks that governments use to deal with prostitution, uh, sex workers' well-being, and hopefully we'll have time to address some additional issues related to this topic. And without any further ado, our first questions. Please tell us a bit about yourself, your experience in the world of prostitution or sex work, and also what concerns you most about the world of prostitution and what's the ideal form you would like to see of this industry. So Allison, please take it away. Okay, I'm Allison Bass. I'm an associate professor of journalism at West Virginia University and a longtime journalist. I worked for the Boston Globe for many years as a medical writer. And I've written a book about sex work called Getting Screwed, Sex Workers in the Law, in which I argue that uh, sex work sh should be decriminalized and to some extent legalized for public health and safety reasons, not only for sex workers, but for many other women and men as well. Thank you very much. Sohe. Um, I am a lawyer by profession. I am the founding executive director of Iroko Onlus, which is an organization, uh, a nonprofit providing services to victims of trafficking and of um, sexual exploitation in Italy. I have also written articles about um, trafficking and uh, prostitution. Okay, Julie. I come in and sexual violence towards girls. And my latest book is The Village Abolishing the Sex Trade Myth, in which I argue that legalization and its close causation is harmful and it normalizes abuse of, of women and male entitlement to access. Uh, Veronica. Hi. So, um, I'm the author of Sex Secrets of Escorts. That's a book about sex. It's not really about escorting. And I currently work as a relationship coach. I've been a relationship coach since 2005 when my book came out. Before that, I worked as a high-end escort from 1989 to um, January of 2004. And during that entire time, I'd say really for the last 30 years, I've been a sex worker rights activist working very actively towards decriminalization. So um, that's kind of me in a nutshell. Okay, let's go to the next question. Um, I'm going to repeat the second part of the first question. I feel that we didn't really, really, I feel that we didn't really get a chance to address it. Um, what concerns you most about the world of prostitution, of sex work, and what's the ideal form you would like to see implemented in this industry? Alice. Well, I feel right now that the laws that criminalize sex work endanger uh, women and men, not only uh, sex workers. Sex workers are like canaries in the coal mine. They are the first to see violent predators, men who prey on women. And very often these men are serial killers or serial abusers. And the first people they prey on are often sex workers, but they don't stop with sex workers. Serial killers like Gary Ridgway, like Ted Bundy, they also kill non-prostitutes. So um, if sex work were decriminalized or legalized, they could um, they would be much more comfortable going and working with the police, which is what they do in New Zealand and the uh, Netherlands. They work with the police to report violent predators. But in this country, they're afraid to go to the police because they're afraid they'll be arrested themselves, which is often uh, what happens. So as a result, violent predators are allowed to operate with impunity. And there's also a public health um, issue involved as well. If sex work were decriminalized and regulated to some extent, it would be much easier 
for sex workers to negotiate safe sex, in other words, i.e. sex with condoms, and to get health care so that to avoid the spread of HIV. Again, in countries that legalize sex work, like the Netherlands and New Zealand, the spread of HIV is among the lowest in the world. Sorry. Um, my position is that um, prostitution must not be legalized um, because it is the oldest form of violence against women, um, because it is incompatible with gender equality, with equality between men and women, because it puts half of the human populace uh, at the disposition for the sexual uh, uh, um, enjoyment of the other half, and that it leads to violence. And my belief is that what I would love to see is a situation where women, those who are in prostitution, are not punished. And that is shifting the discourse from the women in prostitution to the men, ensuring that because they are not the ones who make a choice, it is those who purchase those in prostitution that make a choice. So my position is that I would like to see them no longer punished for this. I would like to see them no longer criminalized, but I would like to see those who purchase sex criminalized. I would like to see the governments putting in resources to ensure that those who are in prostitution are able to exit if they want. They are not being obliged to, but that they are assisted to exit, uh, to exit and that the stigma is removed from them. But I would like to see the sex industry punished because Cases where you see, you see that prostitution also leads to cases of violence against women because those who are in prostitution are viewed as objects to be used. So once you dehumanize someone, mm -hmm. then that person becomes easy to traumatize. And for me, prostitution is one of the oldest form of violence. It's traumatizing for the women and should uh, not be legalized at all. That okay. is my position. Yeah. Thank you very much, Asahi. Julie. Well, I take Alison's point about public health issues and concerns, and I personally have met many people that advocate for the kind of policy approach to prostitution, as does Alison, um, and advocate on a very genuine basis for extremely good reason. But unfortunately, the experiments of decriminalization and legalization in countries Alison mentioned, such as the Netherlands and Germany, of course, we then have the example of some counties in Nevada, in the US, um, and in Switzerland. It, it has been an unmitigated disaster in terms of public health, because, of course, not arresting the women or men, any person who is selling sex, is crucial to this argument. Alison's absolutely right that if people in prostitution, people selling sex, can't safely access justice through police um, or other means, then they are at great risk or greater risk because there is no safe way to be involved in prostitution. So prohibition clearly has not worked. The laws in the US are a nightmare. Um, it, they're punitive, they're inhumane. But all of the, 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 the problems and the issues that prostituted people face that Alison mentions, you know, these, these can be solved by decriminalizing those selling sex, overwhelmingly women, and yes, we acknowledge there are some men and, of course, some transgender people. In terms of HIV and public health, there is no credible research from any credible health organization, including the World Health, World health Organization, that shows that rates of, of transmission of new HIV infections are lower amongst that population in countries with legalization. In fact, if you look at the Lancet Special Edition, published in 2015, which argued that, um, sorry, 2014, which argued that if prostitution were legalized across the world, you would see a drop in new HIV transmissions of around 40% worldwide. The argument from the Lancet Special Edition, which was that if you legalize the sex trade worldwide, you would have a drop in new HIV infections of around 40%, if not more, is risable, and I can speak more about that later. Thank you. <laughs> Veronica, what concerns you the most and what was the ideal form you would like to see of prostitution? What concerns me most about uh, legislation surrounding prostitution is the criminalization of the lives of sex workers. 
So as the anti-trafficking uh, hysteria expresses itself in the United States, at least, and that's what I can speak of from experience, um, our lives are criminalized to the point where our relationships are criminalized. Um, so when, when I was working, I was married, I had children. Um, and fortunately, we hadn't passed some of the anti-trafficking laws that we have now. So I, I've, I lived under a state of, yes, what I was doing was considered a misdemeanor, but it wasn't considered something that my husband could go to jail for. And uh, looking at it from the personal standpoint of my own life um, as a former sex worker, and also as the uh, friend and colleague of other sex workers, it becomes very problematic for us to even assist each other, to show up for each other, because if we are to work together in the same facility, um, like for instance, for a while, a colleague and I shared an apartment. Um, that would have put one of us in prison and possibly made us a sex offender for the rest of our lives. So those kinds of laws that we have here in the United States that are considered anti-trafficking laws make it impossible for a sex worker to function as a human being. And I, I find that the most problematic of all um, and the most oppressive of all. But going back to when I was working as a sex worker up until the year 2004, before we had these really oppressive anti-trafficking laws, um, it was still very uh, stigmatizing and oppressive. So um, whether, whether it's going to the point of making anybody who associates with or lives under the same roof with a, a, a sex worker, some kind of a, a pimp or trafficker now is the word that we use, um, or if we go back to when it was simply a misdemeanor, there was a way in which uh, when I was working for 14 years, my life was criminalized. And, and that's, that's really, um, it's disempowering. Um, it plays into the stereotype about uh, women losing their value and their autonomy whenever they deviate from the sexual norm. And as a feminist, I, I'm really adamant about wanting women to have choice and, and all people of all genders to have choice about when they have sex, why they have sex, and who they have sex with. So that's, that's really, I come from more of the, of the rights standpoint. Here. Thank you very much, Veronica. And um, that brings me to our next question. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Decisions, decisions. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Is there an inherent difference, morally or otherwise, between the prostitution of male, female, and trans people? Uh, why do you feel that that is? Why do you feel that that is the case, Allison? Okay, um, thank you. I just wanted to address something that um, one of the uh, ladies said. Um, the reason why the World Health Organization and the National Association of Science Writers and Amnesty have all called for decriminalization is because they believe there is a link between decriminalization and safer sex and um, lower HIV spread, not only HIV, but other sexually transmitted diseases. So I disagree with, um, I guess it was Julie who said there's no credible link because there is one. Um, now, in terms of the difference between male and female um, sex workers, female sex workers are four or five times more likely to get arrested um, and imprisoned and charged with sex work than male sex workers. And that gets to the double standard we have in this country and actually worldwide about sexuality around um, women. Women are not are not um, are looked down upon. They're called sluts if they have multiple partners, and of course, sex workers are considered the lowest of low because they enjoy sex with multiple partners and they get paid for it. And yet, men and there are almost as many men, male as female sex workers, at least in this country, who cater to the gay community, but they are not um, arrested in nearly the same numbers. Um, and yet, and I think that gets at the way we look at sexuality in decades old patriarchal terms. Women are not allowed to enjoy sex and are not allowed to enjoy sex with multiple partners. There's also a big difference in terms of racial bias. Um, 
minority sex workers in New York City are arrested again at much greater proportion than female sex workers. Um, and transgender sex workers are also harassed and arrested at much greater proportion than um, uh, cis uh, gender sex workers who tend to work indoors. While, uh, you know, I interviewed quite a number of transgender sex workers who work on the streets in Washington, D.C., and they are often not only, um, not only is there violence against um, the, uh, by clients. Just finish, just finish the idea. That was two minutes. Not only is there violence against uh, them by clients, but police also harass them and uh, and force them to have sex in order not to get arrested. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of um, uh, racial bias and uh, transgender bias against sex workers. So there's definite differences. Thank you, Allison. And I just want to remind us that one of the rules of the roundtable is that we simply add to the common pool of meaning. We don't again, we don't argue, just express your opinion. Everybody's smart enough to see the differences. It's so hey. Is there any yes, I I see. I believe that there are quite a lot of differences um, as regards um, prostitution of men and women. First of all, the question of gender, the fact that the way women are introduced into the sex industry is quite different in, in many cases from the way men are introduced into it. And of course, the fact that the greater majority of those in prostitution are women, and the fact of the uh, patriarchal way uh, um, impact of prostitution on women. Poverty, most of those who go into prostitution are women because they are poor, the question of poverty. This is not always the case for men who go into prostitution. And of course, the fact that those who buy prostitution are uh, in the greater majority men, not women. And there's that difference too of relationship between the two genders. Then as regards the question of minorities, um, in countries uh, where you have a, a greater difference of minorities, I, I live and worked in uh, Italy for many years, and you find that those who are being brought in are usually trafficked women into prostitution in, in Italy. And you find the question of they are being much more susceptible to exploitation with respect to men. So, uh, and this is also something that is um, due to their race. Most of them are Nigerians. In, uh, in Italy, and the way they are treated is also an evidence of this. So for me, there are a lot of differences, and I share um, the, the views of the former speaker about the kind of differences also involving transgender people who are in prostitution. Thank you, Esohe. Julie, the question was, um, is there an inherent difference morally or otherwise between male, female, and trans people working as sex workers? Why do you feel that is the case? Well, I don't take a moral position on this at all. I take an ethical human rights point of view on this about the renting or buying and selling of a human body or um, one-sided uh, consensual sex, which clearly is problematic for women, bearing in mind the levels of sexual violence that is a pandemic across the world. There are many, many, many more uh, women in prostitution, women and girls in prostitution than there are men, uh, than there are transgender people. I care about all of them. I care about every single person who's being exploited in prostitution. And I don't want it to happen to anyone who um, is, is clearly uh, not consenting to, to prostitution. Now, the dynamic and the difference between prostituted boys and girls, men and women, is often actually very marginal. I mean, I was the first journalist to take a very serious look um, in a, a long form Guardian article back in 2003 at female sex tourism in Jamaica, where I was interested in the race and class dynamics um, of women who usually white European, but sometimes North Americans do, go to developing countries, impoverished countries, to buy men of colour. Um, and I found many disturbing aspects um, of this behaviour, spoke to many of the women who paid for sex, most of whom were in denial, and interviewed at length the men who were referred to as beach boys or rent-a-dread, some other derisory term. 
Um, and it was as far from pleasant as you can imagine. There were some huge differences, however. The men were not frightened of the women. The men were not raped and beaten by the women. The men were not raped by other women. There were um, huge differences in the way that prostitution transactions occurred. For example, many of the women didn't consider themselves to be going to other countries to pay for sex. They considered that they would have a boyfriend who they would help out financially. Now, I'm not excusing this practice at all. It was certainly built on exploitation, class and race privilege. But the men were not in fear of their lives. And similarly, when I've looked at gay male prostitution, they are being abused by other men. There is yet to be a brothel that opens serving female sex buyers who are paying for sex with men. Um, the numbers of, of, of gay male, uh, or men rather, serving the gay male community, because often the prostituted men um, do not define themselves as gay, um, you know, are small, but of course significant. We need to acknowledge that. But the, the, the kind of women as a sex class and, and male power and privilege afforded at birth is absolutely crucial to look at here. Women do not grow up on an equal playing field at all. Girls are not afforded the privilege that boys have at birth. Mm -hmm. And so there is an instant and endemic and entrenched um, inequality that exists for girls and women who are in prostitution before it even starts. Thank you, Julie. Veronica. Yes. <clears throat> well, I actually absolutely agree with Julie that there is endemic um, differences um, from country to country, worldwide, uh, and it concerns me very deeply. However, I don't look at that through just the lens of prostitution. Um, I feel that that affects employment um, in a broad variety of professions. And I also feel that it affects um, marriage. So when you ask about is there an inherent difference, morally or otherwise, between the genders um, in prostitution, I've had lots of friends of different genders who worked in the sex industry and various different levels in it. Um, and what I have seen um, is not a lot of difference between um, the kind of injustice and uh, sexism, uh, racism, classism that takes place in prostitution, but also takes place in marriage. I, I, I see those things as being correlates that have a lot of similarities. And it's astounding to me that culturally the world, and I do mean the world, seems focused very much on dismantling the sex trade with utter blindness towards the type of um, oppression that takes place within marriages. So for myself, uh, I was a married prostitute for 14 years. And um, working for my own empowerment uh, meant working within the marriage as well. Um, I didn't see that there was some difference between my relationship with men through prostitution and my relationship with men through dating. <clears throat> it was kind of a continuum. Um, and, all my, and, and, and then as far as safety goes, the irony of it was I was uh, date raped, <clears throat> excuse me, twice before I ever got in to the sex trade. Um, and so I actually found college to be a lot less safe than when I was an adult woman who had chosen, after I got my college diploma, to become um, a sex worker. Uh, I was far more empowered. And, and at that point, the real, real risk was the, um, the police. Law enforcement became. Thank you, Veronica. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that about your experiences. Um, and our next question is: <clears throat> Is sex work work? Allison. Yes, it is most definitely work. It's uh, a commercial transaction where uh, for for women who are selling sex by choice. 
it is their choice to um, do this kind of labor. And um, they are not being uh, trafficked. They are not being exploited. And in the United States, at least, and I know the situation is different overseas, particularly in third world countries and Eastern Europe and Africa. But in the United States, at least, the vast majority of um, women who are doing sex work are doing sex work by choice. Um, and they are doing it uh, largely for economic reasons, because uh, it's it's difficult for um, many women to uh, make a living wage. So um, there was a study that was done by the Urban Justice Institute in New York, and the majority of women who are doing sex work are, are doing it because they can't make a living wage otherwise um, and afford to live in New York City. Uh, so it's it, you know it's an economic um, choice, and it is very much um, a choice that they have made. Um, uh, in which they are using their uh, using sex to make a living that they um, and something that they can afford. Many of them are single women who are raising children or they're um, trying to get through school. They're trying to pay their way through uh, university or graduate school. Um, and so it is an economic imperative um, for many women. Now, there are sex workers who do it because they they like it and it empowers them. And uh, I thought it was interesting what Veronica said, because I re uh, remember interviewing a street work a worker in San Francisco who said that uh, um, what's the difference between being in an abusive marriage and being forced to have sex with your husband and she feels more empowered in being able to choose who she has sex with and being paid to have sex. It, it empowers her. So that a significant minority of sex workers do it for that reason. Thank you, Allison. Sex work for me cannot and it's not work. And I'll go back to what I said at the beginning about the fact that prostitution is violence. Why do I say it's violence? Let's look at studies that have been made so far about prostitution. And you find that um, I, I have here a study made by Melissa Farley in 2003, which shows that 55 to 90 percent have been victims of sexual aggression. Um, we find that in prostitution, most of those who go in, there's a correlation between entry into prostitution and violence during childhood. You find that those who end up in prostitution are given a sense of, you know, being uh, separated, the question of they are being separated from themselves and have that dissociation that women who are in prostitution and men, all of those, uh, the, the different studies have shown, all of those who end up in prostitution, the different kinds of trauma that they suffer. So it really shocks me when I hear people presenting this as a kind of work. If we are talking about domestic violence, we don't encourage women who are in violent relationships to remain. We find ways to make them to exit. But when it comes to prostitution, you find people giving all kinds of reasons why it is work, why people should go in, why those who are there should remain. But the fact remains that the majority, the greater majority of mm -hmm. women or men who end up in prostitution do so as a survival mechanism. I've worked with women who were trafficked into prostitution and then ended up in the sex industry for quote and unquote uh, by choice. But the question they say is mm -hmm. if they had an alternative, they will want out. You don't find any of them wanting to remain. You find them wanting to exit as soon as they have the possibility of having a job that pays them to live a dignified life. So for me, it cannot be a, a, a work. Thank you, so Julie? Yes. Great. Okay. Is, is sex work work? No. Um, if, if sex work is, is work, then... Um, then rape is merely theft. The inside of a woman's body, of any person's body, is not a workplace and it's not conducive with working at McDonald's, which is the example that I tend to hear from pro-prostitution, pro... And you seem to have lost Julie. It's, yeah. Veronica, is yeah. sex work work? <laughs> well, I used to work as a sex worker and I'm here to tell you it's work. Um, I, it's funny. I made a six-figure income as a high-end escort and I bought a home and a cousin of mine had bought a home 
And she bought her home because her husband died and he left her some money. I bought my home because I worked as an escort. And I told my mother, my mother was bragging about my cousin. And I said, why, why aren't you proud of me? And she says, yes, well, Phyllis worked for her money. So <laughs> I realized some people have a prejudice that it's some kind of easy job. But I actually graduated from college in 1982. And then I worked in corporate America for seven solid years. I was a sales manager. Um, it was the last job that I had. I was consistently promoted and given raises. Um, I worked as a manager. And when I decided I chose to go into escorting, um, the woman that um, I was working with taught me how to do it. She was also my lover. Um, I asked her to teach me. She didn't try to recruit me. And she actually declined. She said she would not teach me. And I said, well, then I'll just go do it myself. And she goes, no, no, no. There's things you need to know. So um, I apprenticed to her for like nine months, and I was astounded. Here I was, an honor student. I used to tutor English on campus. There was so much to learn to do it um, the way that um, I ended up doing it, which was I, I right off the gate, I, I got a business license and paid taxes. So, um, yeah, it's definitely work. I think it's honorable work. And um, as far as my vagina and how I choose to use it. I always thought it was so funny how people wanted to tell me what I could and could not do with my vagina, but they didn't care what I did with my feet or my hands. When I was uh, working as a secretary, nobody said that I was renting out my fingers uh, or that, uh, and, and I gotta tell you something, the level of oppression that I experienced in corporate America, oh, that's why I ran to the <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Veronica. Julie? Yes. Does sex work work? Okay, so when we hear of men from um, East Africa, for example, selling a kidney because it's the only way he can get safely to Europe or to North America uh, with his family and to escape certain death or famine um, or any other atrocity, we recognize that this is exploitation, that it is not okay for the surgeon, for the broker, for the buyer to actually be involved in the business of buying kidneys or blood or whichever other body parts or products are sold by desperately poor people in developing countries for the benefit um, of, of, of richer, well-off people in, in the global north. And so why is it then that we recognise or that we pretend that the inside of a woman's body can be a workplace when what we're talking about is is an intimacy and an invasion which does not occur in other jobs, even dangerous jobs, even construction, rape and risk of HIV, having your children removed, becoming addicted to, to um, hardcore drugs and alcohol and being pimped and stigmatised. It is actually not an acceptable group of occupational hazards. And unions, of course, which are essential for for those of us that consider ourselves progressives to be in place, if possible, we campaign for union representation of workers. Unions cannot represent prostituted people as though they are in a place of work because unions often represent women for issues of sexual harassment in the workplace. Prostitution is paid sexual harassment and every single attempt at unionization of women in prostitution has failed, even those government funded um, propaganda groups such as those in the Netherlands. They've had very few members and they have failed. Thank you, Julie. And our next question is, is prostitution inherently exploitative, sexually abusive, violent? Does the act of payment change something fundamental about consensual sex between adults? What does it change? Alison. I don't think sex work is inherently exploitative, and the studies bear that out. Um, there's much higher levels of violence against uh, minority sex, uh, sex workers who are on the street and sex workers who are street walkers. Um, in sex workers, uh, very rarely um, there is some violence, but it's much less. So if, if, if sex work were decriminalized and made safer so that women could work indoors safely in collectives and look out for each other, the violence factor would drop 
very strongly. And that, again, has been shown in the Netherlands and New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand is a very good example of where uh, sex work has been legalized and made much safer um, because um, it, it, is, it is regulated and sex workers work in collectives or in brothels or in massage parlors, but uh, there's just a much lower level of violence there. So sex work is not currently exploitation for illegal. What was the second part of your question? Um, does the act of payment change something fundamental about consensual sex leaking adults? I don't think there's any difference between an older man like Donald Sterling, who used to own the Yankee Clippers, and had a, you know, paid for a much younger woman, had a, uh, he paid her rent, he, um, you know, gave her an expensive car, he made, allowed her to live in luxury. How is that any different from someone who goes to a sex worker for a few hours and pays for it? I don't see any different. I think that one is legal. What Donald Sterling and older men like Donald Trump do is perfectly legal, while as um, men and women who engage in straightforward commercial transactions is illegal. And I think that's the height of the problem. Thank you. Is that okay? Yes. Um... The first question was if prostitution is exploitative, right? Is it inherently exploitative? It's inherently exploitative. Now, in prostitution, you have, it's, it's really amazing the way we tend to deny the harm of prostitution. Let's look at what is happening in prostitution and just not like some kind of socially accepted activity. What happens in prostitution can, in many cases, be likened to torture, to activities of torture. I mean, this is not the place to go into explicit description of what actually happens. But if one looks at studies that have been done, and even going on the internet, there are several sites where you see buyers describing what they do to women in prostitution and the way they are treated. And the fact that the demand for prostitution has led to ever greater demand in the West. And, and so sex trafficking, bringing in women who are being sexually exploited. The fact that those who are in prostitution, the greater majority of them do not, cannot be there alone. Like someone, one of the studies that said, most of them have pimps. You hardly ever have situations where they don't have pimps. Men or other women who profit from the prostitution of others. That is a known fact in the sex industry, even though we try to deny it. That's one. Then the second part of the question about if the act of payment um, uh, leads to any difference in consensus, I think that was the question you asked. The fact of paying also shows the kind of attitude that those who the purchasers have towards the women in prostitution. To them, they are like objects that can use, that they purchase for their, for their sexual pleasure. You, the, it's like when I buy a bottle of water, drink it and throw away the bottle. Like when you speak to women in prostitution, this is the kind of effect they say that they have from the fact that they've been bought. And so rape becomes a kind of accepted, because it's been paid for, it is accepted. Thank you, Sai. Julie? Well, there is hellish violence in prostitution as the murder statistics bear out. And murders, of course, of prostituted women in the main um, in countries that have legalized or decriminalized. So for example, in countries where prostitution is not seen as um, harmless is seen as a crime um, against the human being, um, such as uh, Sweden, Norway, France, and other countries where the sex buyer is criminalized and not the prostituted person. There has been one murder across all of those countries since that law was introduced, and that obviously one murder is one too many. Whereas if you look at other countries that have normalized prostitution, supposedly for the sake of the safety of those involved, there have been countless murders. There have been dozens of murders by pimps and by Johns. So it's clearly a very, very dangerous um, way to live and to earn money. And I think that we have to look at what the men who pay for sex, because of course sex buyers are overwhelmingly men, what they say about the so-called service that they're purchasing. I've interviewed 
dozens of men uh, who pay for sex um, in detailed um, interviews face to face where they've spoken about the woman as merely a vessel a subhuman where they've talked about how they enjoy it if she clearly isn't enjoying it where they've talked about their sadistic fantasies because what they're paying for is exactly what they know they'll get they talk about having sex with this woman that they're buying um, the kind of sex that they want is the kind of sex that no woman would consent to in a regular, enjoyable, two-way street kind of sexual encounter. So what he's paying for is effectively to do things to her that she really does not want and certainly doesn't enjoy. And then if you look at the health effects, we don't just have to look at the, the health effects on women that are based on the physical body. We need to look at the trauma that women face um, when that they can finally admit to when they leave the sex trade. You know, I'm one of the the authors and the researchers on the largest study on women exiting prostitution, all forms of prostitution, including escorting, as well as a small number of women who were trafficked and then those on the street and off street, where they talk about the mental health effects on them because of the actual sex of prostitution. So the money is literally the coercion the women do not want to have sex with the men, or a clue is they wouldn't actually be selling sex. They would be having consensual sex with that man. Thank you, Billy. And Veronica? Because it's prohibited. When I was working for those 14 years, I really did not have the ability to go to law enforcement for any kind of support. Um, and so I was really on my own, uh, and I did not have a pimp. I was working for myself. Uh, so, and when I wanted to work with a colleague where we could actually uh, support each other and create safety for each other, that then puts one of us in the position of committing a felony. So um, the way the laws exist, it certainly did increase the risk to my person and my safety. But I, I want to, to say that I've worked with domestic violence survivors and rape survivors, um, and I think that it's so important to validate the experience of survivors in whatever circumstance they have been abused, whether that's in marriage or by their own father um, or by a school teacher or by a client when they're a sex worker. And it disturbs me when we take the discussion away from eliminating abuse and protecting those who have been abused and start attacking their lifestyle or their gender orientation or their sexual orientation or their profession. Uh, I think these are separate issues. I don't want to abolish marriage just because most of the women that I've encountered who suffered domestic violence have done so at the hands of their own husbands and boyfriends. I think that would be uh, overreaching to say, oh, we should abolish marriage. But I certainly have seen the fallout of a lot of abusive, dysfunctional marriages. And likewise, I don't want to invalidate those sex workers who have been abused in sex work. But I don't think it's the sex work. I think we live in a very sexist, patriarchal world where men abuse women. Period. Thank you, Veronica. Um... What is the essential difference, if any, between prostitution and porn or a sugar daddy relationship, like the ones people find on seeking arrangement, et cetera, or even the case like um, Allison mentioned of a trophy wife relationship, where it's very clear that the interest in the uh, husband wife relationship is, is financial. Uh, why is uh, prostitution criminalized and these others are acceptable and legal? That's a good question, Trevor. Um, before I end it, I just wanted to say that uh, studies have shown, look on a lot of the uh, review boards, um, men, many men are respectful of sex workers and many men um, really fall for their sex workers, um, but sex workers try to keep the, you know, the relationship very discreet and transactional. Um, but so I have to say that I don't think that uh, I think most of the time clients are respectful and um, very feel very privileged to go to a sex worker who knows what she's doing 
and um, to get their needs met. So uh, they are not exploiting the sex worker, is what I'm trying to say. Now, um, in terms of the difference, I, again, don't see much difference between um, this kind of arrangement um, where an older man pays a younger woman's rent or bills or whatever um, in exchange for sex and intimacy than um, a straightforward transaction where someone goes to a sex worker for an hour or two and, and hands over money. To me, it's the same thing. Um, and again, this go on a continuum with um, older men uh, many of them married who have uh, a younger mistress and again pay their bills. Um, I don't see the difference. Um, money is being exchanged in return for sex. And to me, it's all the same. Thank you, Allison. Yes, I. That's a very interesting question. And I think we need to be very careful because. Sometimes where there's a dividing line is really very, very difficult to find. Now, when you talk about um, the sugar daddy kind of thing where um, an older man pays for a younger woman, here we're not talking about a situation where you have multiple sex partners, people you don't know, but in a situation where there's a certain kind of relationship that can sometimes be created between these people. And it's more of a kind of interest relationship, which is quite different from the kind of situation you find in prostitution. That is one. But you also have um, situations of, uh, uh, when you talk of uh, situations of prostitution that is, uh, um, sorry, I'm mixing it up. When you talk of um, pornography and prostitution, pornography is that, part that prepares, it is an inherent part of prostitution that prepares the, the, the prostitution situation. So I don't see any difference between pornography and prostitution. I don't see much difference in many cases of the so-called online um, sugar daddy cases where um, uh, men go to search for young women to buy because they pay their bills and the women, uh, they, they pay the bills for the women in exchange for sex for, from the women. I don't really see any difference there. I think they are all the same kind of situations. And we shouldn't um, separate them to make them seem as if they are different. I mean, pornography is the preparatory ground for prostitution. They are part of the same things. Those who are in prostitution are made to watch pornographic images in order to carry out those activities in prostitution. Thank you, Sorry. Julie. I interviewed a group of women in Cambodia who were in prostitution, and they, they told me that the worst violence from the science uh, rooted in their you know, prolific pornography consumption, where they would have really nasty gonzo violent porn uh, on their phones that they would then play and make the woman watch and act out the same kind of scenario, which clearly um, was not what they wanted at all. And pornography is is prostitution, but with a camera. Um, you know, it is, as, as Asori says, it, it is part of the same sex industry. You know, I think that if we look at the different kinds of, of aspects of the sex trade, because clearly there is, you know, a difference between being on street um, or being a so-called sugar babe, you can see something that's a core element, which is male exploitation of women because we're females. Some of the women that I interviewed for my book, and um, you know, I, I talked to to um, fifty sex trade survivors, all of whom had been in prostitution for some time before finally being able to exit, told me that the worst case scenario for them, and this was without an exception, they all told me that the worst torture that they'd endured in prostitution was something called the girlfriend experience. They said it was far worse to have to be with this particular sex buyer for a week or a couple of nights or, a, or two weeks or living in a flat that he visited whenever he wanted than it was to have a kind of four minute bone shaker out in the street or half an hour in a brothel because she had to pretend to like him, to engage with him. She had to smile constantly till her jaws ached she felt sick at the idea that he was replicating what should have been a fun human relationship when, in fact, all it was was him buying access 
to the inside of her body and messing up her head. Thank you, Julie. Veronica. Yes. Uh, it's all different. And, and it's not only all different, it's different for individuals, depending on how they're working and why they're working. For myself, um, I entertained the idea of going into stripping and because my boyfriend at the time, in 1989, my boyfriend was a male stripper and seemed to be having a lot of fun. And I walked into a very popular uh, strip club and thought, uh, there is no way I would find that so degrading to work as a stripper. Now, I had girlfriends who were strippers and they were very happy. I don't want to make that choice for them. I don't want to tell them what's degrading and what's not degrading. I personally would never want to sit on somebody's lap um, and grind into them. I just, ugh, it made me gross out. But I have produced pornography. And there again, I didn't want to star in a male produced uh, piece of pornography. I, I had objections and I still do have huge objections to mainstream male produced pornography. I don't like sexuality that comes from the male gaze. So I went out and produced my own feminist centric pornography and um, found it to be empowering. I enjoyed the process a great deal. I was in behind the camera. I was in front of the camera. Um, and I went into escorting. I chose to become the girlfriend experience. I became a high-end escort, a, a courtesan. I spent days with one client. I had clients that stayed with me for 12 years. And we built very intimate relationships. But there was a professional boundary to it. And I found that very empowering and uplifting. Now, I do not want to discount the woman who would rather do a quickie and not have to see that guy and doesn't want to listen to his problems. Anybody is allowed to choose what they want to do. And that's really what I'm about is twice empowering people of all genders who have choice. Thank you, Veronica. And I... Next question is, what's the difference, if you feel there is one, between willing prostitution and sex trafficking? Uh, can you explain the difference? Where exactly does the line, this relates to what Asoha was saying about finding the, the line, where does the line separating the two pass? And how does the prevalence and availability of prostitution affect the prevalence of trafficking? And how does it affect the prevalence of underage prostitution? and trafficking? Big question. Allison. All right. Well, trafficking is defined according to U.S. federal law as um, engaging in sex by force or coercion. Um, so it's not your choice. And so there's a very distinct difference between trafficking and people having sex by choice. The other thing that's um, defined by federal law is anybody under the age of 18 is automatically considered a trafficking victim because they have not reached the age of consent, whether they consider themselves trafficking victims or not. So a federal law is very clear on that. Um, and in the United States, at least, as I said before, the vast majority of women, adult women who are doing sex, are selling sex by choice. They are not trafficked. What we have in the United States, and we've had this as a problem for decades, and it demands our best minds to solve, is the problem of teenage runaways, both young boys and girls, who are um, run away from homes where they've been abused and neglected, or if they're LGBTQ, have been made to feel unwelcome, and they move to larger cities or urban areas, and they sell sex for survival on the street. Those are trafficking victims. But according to our many of our, our current laws, um, they are arrested, and a lot of our resources currently go into law enforcement when our resources should be going into helping these uh, young boys, these boys and girls, get out of um, uh, sex work. In other words, giving them education, counseling, um, uh, social services, and housing, so they don't feel they have to sell sex for survival on the streets. But right now, our resources go into arresting them where they are, and putting them into foster care situations where they're often re-traumatized. Um, so that is really the main problem of trafficking in this country. There is some trafficking of illegal migrant, um, 
immigrants, but it is much, much lower and less of a problem than it is in Europe and other parts of the world. Now, in terms of, um, there are studies again when Netherlands legalized prostitution, prostitution did not go up. Um, and, it, and, in, and in fact, and so the counter to that, so, so um, when you decriminalize prostitution, you do not see an increase in trafficking. And that, and yet in Sweden, where they criminalize the buyers, which is not a good idea because that makes sex work more dangerous for everyone. It makes it less likely for sex workers to be able to negotiate safe sex safely. In other words, use condoms, they're rushed into transactions because clients are now afraid of getting arrested. So in Sweden, which criminalized buyers, they did not see a drop in trafficking. Um, so criminalized, criminal laws do not prevent or, or lower trafficking. And New Zealand, of course, well, part of it is its isolated uh, location, but they, don't, they didn't see a surge in trafficking when they legalized prostitution either. Um, so- uh, I'll just finish the sentence. Well, I just was going to say that um, legalizing prostitution does not lead to an increase in trafficking. In fact, the inverse is true. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, okay. Now, um, w w I look at the definition, the internationally accepted definition of um, trafficking mm -hmm. under um, the Palermo Protocol, uh, Article 3. And if you look at that definition, you see that uh, examples of cases that we receive from places in the U.S., like Nevada, where people who, uh, women who are supposedly in prostitution by choice, are placed in um, areas where they don't have that freedom of movement, where the, the prostitution areas are cordoned off, um, they are not allowed to move freely, which buys into that definition of trafficking as um, being obliged, when you talk of sex trafficking, as by coercion, not by choice, and not being able to leave, and, and all of what that, that uh, definition says. When you see how women end up, women and men, those in prostitution end up in prostitution, it goes through the same kind of process. Violence, sexual exploitation as children, and then being gradually inducted into an industry that they no longer, in most cases, majority, I always stress that majority of cases, because we're not looking at the 1% that maybe had the privilege of having a situation that is not as terrible as the others, but we are looking at the greater majority of those who are in prostitution. And you find that the issue of prostitution is what leads to sex trafficking. In countries like uh, the Netherlands, where prostitution was legalized, you find that the government has had to import women from uh, countries where, uh, um, from other countries in order to fill in the demand for prostituted women, because women in those, in those countries do not want to go into that industry. Where the, 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 the economic and social conditions of women are okay, you will hardly find them going into prostitution. So both of them, there's no separation between prostitution and trafficking. They are two sides of the same coin. Thank you, Soe. Julie, you still have time? Yep, sure. Well, you know, the London School of Economics on how trafficking does actually increase um, in countries that have decriminalized and legalized its sex trade. Obviously, traffickers are not going to go into a country such as Sweden, where buying sex or attempting to pay for sex is illegal. They're, and where the women are helped by the police, they're going to go to a country that has an open field and where traffickers and pimps are welcome. Um, I do agree with Alison that I think that way too much attention is put on the term trafficking as though the rest of the sex trade is absolutely fine. I personally think it's all abuse and it should all be criminalised in terms of the buyer and the exploiter and decriminalised for those who are selling sex. But, you know, I don't agree with um, every single case of exploitation and prostitution being labelled trafficking. Quite the opposite. I actually would, I call trafficking international pimping. To actually say that we care about trafficking, however low you are going to argue the numbers are, 
and evidence is that these numbers are high. But if you're going to argue that you should only focus on trafficking, which is the bad side of the sex trade, and ignore the good side of it, which is all choice and freedom and empowerment, uh, which is the regular prostitution, it would be like saying that we should look at domestic homicide, but not concern ourselves with domestic violence, because you wouldn't actually have any prostitution or abuse within the sex trade at all, uh, were it not for the attitude that men can pay for access to women. And certainly uh, you wouldn't have any trafficking anywhere in the world if it was not for the fact that we have sex industries that are normalized and seen as the leisure industry for men. Thank you, Julie. Veronica? Well, I have to agree. I don't think we would have trafficking if sex wasn't seen as um, a commodity or wealthy people. Um, and I'm against trafficking. Um, but I'm, I'm against trafficking of all kinds, not just sexual trafficking. Um, and I think while we're looking at trafficking, it's, it's astounding to me. Nobody seems to be concerned about mail order brides um, and uh, people who import their wives. Uh, we should be looking at systems of abuse across the board, whether those take place in boardroom or if they take place in the marriage vows. Um, you know, there's a lot of traditions that marry children off before they even of age. Um, and we don't, we don't go up against any of these systems of patriarchal oppression. We focus strictly on penalizing women who choose to be sexually empowered and make their own decisions about whose penis they're going to stick in their vagina. And I don't think that's anybody's business, but that woman's choice. I think it's her choice. So I, the way trafficking is translated in my country, the United States, uh, it's, it's made any kind of sex act that a woman would choose to do um, trafficking. And it's uh, interesting because it has become very gendered. So there's a way in which there are, there's nobody paying attention to men who should, transgenders who are doing prostitution. It's only interested in anybody who presents as female. If we look female, then we're going to go to jail. And we are victims. We're not allowed to make any choice about our bodies or our sex lives. It's the government's choice. The government gets to decide for us. I'm, I'm very opposed to that. Um, I would like, if we're going to use this word trafficking, for it to only apply to places where people are being forced to do things that they don't want to do. And we've got to start honoring and respecting the voice of individual women. Individual women say, I choose this. You've got to respect that. Thank you, Veronica. Woo. A lot of information. So I want to transition a little bit to um, different kind of government attitudes toward uh, the se sex work. And my first question on this topic is, what is the difference between criminalization, uh, between criminalization, between the legalization, and between the decriminalization attitudes and also the Nordic model of sex work? Uh, which strategy do you think is best for society and why do you think so? Allison. Okay. All right. Yes. Yeah. There, there are distinct differences. Uh, decriminalization, per se, is just basically getting rid of criminal laws, um, both federal and state laws that criminalize prostitution. And they're very, as we talked about previously, they're very onerous in the United States, and they make um, sex work, and, um, and I think they encourage violence against women um, and men. So, and I, that's why I think we need to change those laws. Now, legalization, there are different forms of legalization. I think the most effective model is the one that's done in New Zealand, where it's uh, kind of a hybrid decriminalization legalization model. So um, it's legal to sell sex, um, both individually, and it's also legal to sell sex in brothels and um, massage parlors. But the people who have to be licensed and regulated are the people who run the brothels and the massage parlors, not the individual sex workers. And that's a very important distinction because in places like Germany and the Netherlands, the women and men themselves have to be licensed. And that is akin to putting a scarlet A on people because there is still tremendous stigma about sex work. But in the Netherlands, they avoid that stigma by um, having the institutions themselves licensed. And that works because 
Um, if, for instance, somebody employs an underage sex worker in one of these brothels in New Zealand or an illegal immigrant, they can be shut down. The license can be uh, revoked. And municipalities decide whether they want the uh, brothels and massage parlors in their community. So each community makes that decision, and that's the way it should be. Um, they probably don't want a brothel or, or a massage parlor uh, close to a school or a playground. Um, and it's up to municipalities to decide. So, if you don't like the market, uh, the only place that's currently legal in the United States is Nevada, but only in the community. Um, now, Sex workers are free to go. I interviewed quite a number of sex workers in these legal brothels. I flew out there and went to several of the brothels. And they, um, you know, enjoy what they do. Uh, they uh, can come and go. There is, you know, uh, very little restriction on their movement. They do test for drugs and alcohol. You can't bring in drugs and alcohol in the, uh, the brothels. Um, and you can't um, practice. I mean, it's kind of ironic that sex is illegal, sex work is illegal in Sin City, Las Vegas, and Reno, but a, an hour or 45 minutes outside of Reno, Nevada, and the rural county, it is legal. Um, however, it is um, the reason why a lot of sex workers don't like it, even though it's a very safe environment, is because um, most of the profits go to the corporate um, entities, mostly men, who own these brothels and massage parlors. And if sex were um, legal the way it is in um, New Zealand, sex workers could work in small collectives uh, with each other, and they would retain the profits, and it would be a much safer environment. They could look after each other, um, and that would be a hybrid decriminalization uh, legalization model, and I think that's the most effective approach. Thank you, Alison. Awesome. Veronica. Okay. Um I'm sorry. Can you restate the question? <laughs> sure. What's the difference uh, between criminalization, yes. legalization, decriminalization, right. the Nordic model of sex work? Which of the strategies do you think is best? Right. Um, so in my country, I'm very much for decriminalization. Um, I'm not for legalization because we have legalization in the state of Nevada. Um, I as a feminist, find any kind of male pimping of females to be um, obnoxious and egregious and oppressive. So I don't want to speak out against any of, of the men, women, and transgenders who are working in those brothels in Nevada. Um, I'm standing in solidarity with them, but I personally feel that the men who run those brothels and even the women who run a couple of the brothels are run by women um, are ascribing to a patriarchal model that I find oppressive. So I, it's the New Zealand model of decriminalization that I find affinity with. Um, what I appreciate about that is that they make it legal for up to four sex workers to work in the same home. And that means that those sex workers are able to support each other and protect each other. And um, it's, it's a good working environment. Um, when we start getting into brothels, I feel that we probably need to have more of legalization around that. Because any time, um, and having worked in corporate America as a secretary, I could say any time there is a corporation, there is an opportunity for abuse. And particularly when uh, sex is stigmatized, particularly for women, then the, the opportunity for abuse is pretty extreme. Um, so I don't think it's um, right to tell women that they can't vote in the county that they work in, that they don't have uh, the ability to move around, that they put them behind these barbed wire fences. I have visited the brothels in Nevada, and they look like prison camps to me. So I'm not for legalization in the United States. I am for decriminalization, very much like New Zealand did it. Thank you, Veronica. Ms. Sai, we return to you. Um, yes, can you hear me now? Yes, very well. Thank okay. you. Okay. Apologize. Yes, yes. Um, I was saying that I don't want to go into the confusion of legalization, criminalization, because then it, it takes attention from the core of the question. And the question is, is it okay for 
some part of the population to have access to purchase the bodies of the other part of the population in commercial sex? That is a question. And for me, neither the uh, US model of uh, criminalization or the New uh, Zealand uh, model is okay because there is a reason why we talk about prostitution and the need for the law to come in. Once upon a time, slavery was regarded as an acceptable form of commercial uh, activities. Now, it is, uh, there is nobody that will ever accept that in, in, in the world today. It's the same thing with prostitution. In prostitution, let's look at, again, I will cite this research uh, of uh, Melissa Fall in 2008, where you find that 82% 82, 82 of women uh, on an international level, so we're not talking of just one country, but multiple countries, 82% of women in prostitution have been physically assaulted. 83% have been treated with a, uh, threatened with a weapon. 64%, uh, 68% have been raped. 84% are or have been homeless. So we are talking of a situation of extreme violence. And the only model that we see, that I as a person and also my group that we see as uh, feasible is the Nordic model. And the Nordic model, what does it say? When you speak of prostitution, the issue goes immediately to women because the majority are women. And of course, the stigma. Women are stigmatized, they are violated, they are traumatized. We say, let us take that attention from women and shift it to those who buy, because they are actually the ones who make a choice. 99% of those in prostitution, of the uh, women in prostitution, do not make a choice. Because when you talk of choice, you are talking of having two equal situations where if I choose A or if I choose B, I get to the same result. But in, for women who go into prostitution, it is hardly ever like that. So the only option is to ensure that those who, who sell sex are not punished, and so they, they must be decriminalized. The government needs to put in resources in the different countries to ensure that they are able to live, they're able to train, they're able to get jobs. And I'm not just talking of survival level jobs, but jobs that give enough pay for them to have dignified life, and then to shift the attention to those who buy and to ensure that the violence that is in prostitution is removed by punishing them, by, discrimi by, by discouraging uh, uh, commercial sexual activities and ensuring that a, a portion of, the, of um, the population is no longer put on sale to the other portion. So I'm very much in support of the Nordic model. Thank you, Sorry. Uh, and our next question is, can there be a happy, willing, satisfied prostitute? Or is sex work inherently abusive, making all prostitutes automatically victims? Allison. Uh, I think we've talked about this before. Um, that we don't, I don't believe, and I've done extensive interviews with a wide range of sex workers, I uh, do not believe that are being exploited and that they're very happy doing what they do. Um, and so, yes, there are sex workers that are not happy in the trade, um, that feel that they are exploited. But again, the majority of them are doing it for economic reasons and they are happy with the work they do and they're doing it for, you know, to, towards an end. Um, many sex workers, again, they do it, uh, they do it for several years. Um, this, uh, sex work, young sex workers that were 21 and above in this brothel that I spoke to in Midtown Manhattan. Um, some of them were going to school. Uh, some of them were paying for graduate school. Um, <clears throat> one or two of them were single mothers. And they were doing sex work toward the end. And they did not feel abused. And they felt safe. Um, and so they are not all victimized. Um, and you know, I completely agree with Veronica that um, uh, it is the choice of the woman to decide what she should do, um, what she is going to do with her body. And just like, you know, I believe in choice, free choice, uh, for, and pro choice for, uh, if you need to get an abortion, you should also be able to, um, uh, sell sex if it is your choice and, and it is something you want to do. Many sex workers are not being victimized. That doesn't, uh, negate the fact that there are some that are. Thank you, Allison. Sorry. 
Um, I think I would borrow the words of um, one uh, of a German woman, Ellen Templin, the director of a Dominique's uh, studio in Berlin, who said that there is no voluntary prostitution and that a woman who prostitutes herself has reason for doing so. And from what we have heard so far, the reasons are almost always for survival reasons. For almost all of those in prostitution, they do it because of survival. If then someone now says, and I think they are the ones who become the experts there, where most of them, the greater majority of them, they say, if they had a choice of something else to do, they would never go into prostitution. As I said before, when you find the uh, economic and social conditions of women are okay, you would hardly see them going into prostitution. And what is happening now in Europe, countries like uh, Greece, for instance, where there is this economic downtown, uh, downturn, you find that there are much more women going into prostitution now as a survival mechanism. When I work with victims of trafficking, those who end up in prostitution says, oh, we just need to go into it for a short while, get some money together and get out as fast as we can. I am yet to meet one single one that said, oh, she loves it. This gives her empowerment. No, it is always a, con a, a situation of the need to put together some money to feed their family, the need to have money to pay their bills, the, the lack of opportunities to get a job or to get appropriate training. And so for the majority of them, there is hardly anything enjoyable in having to open their most intimate parts to people they don't know day in, day out, sometimes up to 20, 30 men in one day. And for them, there's no enjoyment there. There's nothing there that you say, oh, she's happy doing what she does. She likes it. Well, they are getting money to pay their bills. So that part of it is being, is being satisfied. So they have to be happy doing that, getting that money, but not happy with the activities that are involved in prostitution. And they don't want to be in. One, because of the violence, two, because of the trauma that they suffer, and three, because of the stigma. So the, the, we have no, I have never met any woman that said she was happy to be in there in prostitution. Thank you, Soya. Veronica, you know any happy prostitutes? I was uh, a very happy prostitute. I loved my work, uh, and I chose the it. The exception. I had a lot of choice. I worked um, as a secretary, and I hated that. I worked as a sales manager, and I hated that. Um, and when I got into sex industry, um, the first hurdles I had to get past were other people's opinions. And, and uh, uh, I had an assumption because the seven years that I'd worked in corporate America, I had to do what my boss told me to do. That's what my paycheck relied upon. Um, so when I got into the level of the sex industry that I got into, and I and I need, need to really stress as a college-educated white woman, I was able to choose and write my own ticket. I chose to do escorting that was very high level, and I got to be very choosy about the types of clients that I saw and what I did for money. So uh, I don't want to negate those people who are doing survival sex. I'm sure that they may feel forced to do things that they don't want to do. Uh, I don't want anybody in the sex industry who isn't enjoying it. Uh, I just don't want those of us who have enjoyed it to be criminalized. So for the 14 years that I was working as a high-end escort, um, I traveled around and ate in fine restaurants and stayed in fine hotels and met some very uh, wealthy, powerful men who I found very exciting to um, be in the company of. Um, it was a lot more fun was sitting at my desk typing. And um, so I enjoyed it. But but I also wanted to say that it was part of my spiritual path. And I wasn't selling sex. I was actually selling my time. And then what I did during that was often uh, a lot of conversation, uh, being a creative and spiritual news. And I, I also brought this sacred sexual component to it. So um, it, it's, it's something that a lot of sex workers actually bring Tantra and um, sacred prostitution to their practice. And, and that part of the profession, a lot of times is ignored. We just start talking about it like it's a pornographic film. And, and 
frankly, um, there's a lot of sex going on in marriages that I think is far more degrading than what prostitutes who ascribe to sacred prostitution would be doing with their clients. Very, very interesting. Um, sadly, our time is running out. Allison, I hope we have time for one last question. I promised Allison would be done in time. She's like, uh, <laughs> yes, no? I'll go, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, one last question. Beautiful. Um, so I wanted to ask about prohibition. How does the prohibition of prostitution affect the level of criminal enterprises involved in sex work? How does it affect trafficking of sex workers? How does it affect the level of violence against prostitutes? Uh, how does it affect the level of violence against women in general population? Um, and also, I think we touched about it a little bit, but I think it ties into it. How much does prohibition affect the willingness and ability of prostitutes to come forward and report violent crime against themselves or others? Well, I really do uh, believe prostitution is very similar to uh, when alcohol was prohibited, and it's also analogous to the criminalization of marijuana. When you decriminalize drugs, when you decriminalize um, alcohol, that gets rid of the that that lowers to a great extent the criminal underbelly of those industries. And I think the same thing is true of sex work. And that again has been shown particularly in New Zealand uh, when we realized prostitution to get rid of the under the criminal underbelly and it and it actually uh, gets rid of exploitative and criminal tenants who abuse sex workers. Sex workers are much more likely and able to work on their own when it's uh, decriminalized and legalized to some extent, and that again is also true to some extent in the Netherlands as well, which has been legalized. Um, there's there's less of a need for pimps, both to protect the sex workers and also, um, you know, to profit from the sex workers. Sex workers can go it alone to a much greater extent when prostitution is legalized. So prohibition um, allows the flourishing of criminal elements and legalization would get rid of a lot of that criminal ele element, in my opinion. Um, and again, you know, what we talked about before, and this has been proven that when uh, sex workers in other countries where it's legalized, are, uh, they feel comfortable in working with the police against exploitative pimps and against traffickers, and also against violent predators. They're much more uh, likely to go to police to report these people. Um, than they are in places like the United States where um, sex work is uh, criminalized. So they would be much more likely to report um, trafficking, for instance, uh, true cases of trafficking, and they would be much more likely to report violent predators and exploitative pimps if sex work were decriminalized. Sure. Thank you very much for your time, Allison. And the slide. Well, um, I would look at it from a different angle as this. When we talk about, uh, um, we, we're here we're talking about the privileges of men, substantially, because the greater majority of buyers are men and the greater majority of sellers are women. It's a gendered activity. Prostitution is gendered. We cannot escape from that. Now, talking about this kind of uh, privileges, we are talking about protecting men's right to access women's bodies in prostitution. And I wouldn't put that on the same level as um, the prohibition of alcohol or things like that, because there's just no basis for that comparison on that level. But on the other hand, there's also the question of saying, if you remove, if you have um, something that hurts you, a pain, you have something that's sticking into your skin, you don't look for a way to make it to hurt less. You remove that thing from your skin. And that is what prostitution should be. Because we see the violence from several studies that have been uh, carried out, even a recent study where it was found that when you compare sex buyers with non-sex buyers, there's a difference in the way, in their attitudes to women, the way they behave, the kind of violence that they demonstrate towards women, if they are sex buyers, it's much higher than if they are not. In many cases, you find that those who are sex buyers are more likely to look at uh, women in prostitution as a different kind of women, as if they are different from normal women, as if they are not human, almost, as if they are subhuman. While men 
who don't buy uh, sex look at women in prostitution and say, no, this should not be happening to a woman because she could be my mother, she could be my sister, she could be my cousin. So this is the level on which I want to see that. And for me, the violence in prostitution is enough to say that this is an activity that should not be socially accepted. And of course, there's always that question, like we say in law, for every general rule, there's an exception. And the exception is that tiny minority that says, oh, this is okay for me and I choose it. But the greater majority are the ones that we need to protect. Mm -hmm. and, by, and by adopting the Nordic model, we are ensuring that one, women are no longer stigmatized or punished for uh, going into choosing an activity that allows them to have uh, some income. And two, that the government is ready to support them to exit if they want to. And three, that those who go to women with an idea to bind them as objects for their own use should be punished. That is my position on this. Thank you very much, Isola. Veronica. Well, I think that um, I would love to live in a world where we could take the gender out of our discussions. Um, I think gender is becoming more fluid. Um, in subsequent generations, and we're moving into a place where we really need to start talking about people. Um, and, and, but at this particular time in 2018, we're still having to address ways in which um, women are uniquely singled out um, as being suspect around sexual behavior. Um, as long as we have the taboos that we have around women's sexuality, it's very difficult to have an intelligent conversation about sex for as a profession. Um, but there certainly have been instances historically when that was the case. And um, I would love to, for there to be room in our cultural discourse, for there to be sacred sexuality practiced uh, between consenting adults who are not paying each other and sacred sexuality that is provided as a professional service. I think that there's a lot of healing benefits to sexuality. I think that um, cultures that are more sexually permissive are more peaceful. Um, some of the cultures that come to mind are like the Maswa in China. And, and then one of my favorites is the bonobos, which is not even a human animal. But um, I, I'm, I'm looking for us to be more sexually uh, enlightened and empowered across the genders so that we can have a more peaceful, loving world. And I think as long as we're afraid of our sexuality uh, and afraid of each other sexually, there's a way in which we are ascribing to a more violent and, and hateful world. So, I wasn't born as a, uh, in the um, generation that was a hippie, but I guess I'm kind of a make love, not war. <laughs> <laughs> born in the wrong decade. As, as a segue, uh, I believe the bonobos actually practice prostitution. You, you can get some from a banana. <laughs> practice prostitution. Um, sadly, it seems that um, our time we're, has gotten just... in. Yeah, we have we have a fifty percent rate of attrition. Not every everybody made it to the finish line. It's all very very tragic. I have so many questions left to ask, but sadly we are out of time. I think it was fascinating. We, I we think can have a second. We can have a second um, um, discussion right. table. So yeah, some other time. We'll, we'll definitely we'll definitely consider circling back to it. I think we'll see how. I think people will will appreciate that. Uh, I think it was very very positive. I believe. Here's the thing. I believe in general that these issues that feel, people feel very, very polarizing are usually complex. I definitely feel that this issue is complex. I think there's kind of a spectrum of experiences in the world of sex work. If we're talking about uh, porn or prostitution or, or the trophy wife, or if we're talking even about the high ticket escort in Manhattan versus a four pound uh, street worker in Liverpool or a child that's being... Um, trafficked in Mombasa. I think these are very, very, very different worlds, different experiences, different realities. And I think it's important to be able to actually listen to each other and kind of see where each other are coming from because 
I know that it's always talking from experiences and from people that she met and people that she talked and she's very, very invested in it. And she's been doing it for many, many years. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that could use a lot of help. And I know that Veronica is talking from personal experience and also, and there's a lot of people who find it a very, very positive experience. And, and she's sharing that perspective. And I think it's the fact that we were able to come together and share these and kind of discuss this a bit. I think it's very, very important towards uh, moving towards solutions and actually caring. I think in general, it's important to start caring about each other as human beings. I think, I believe personally that it starts with the ability to listen to each other. I think that helps with humanizing other people and other points of view. If you're able to listen to them, first of all, respectively, uh, respectively, respectfully, and uh, I got it, <laughs> respectfully, and um, and understand their point of view, even if you don't necessarily agree with it. And I thank you very much, Asoya. I thank you very much, Veronica. Uh, I thank also hey. Julie and um, Allison who left us. I'll link below afterwards to resources and ways to keep in touch with the different participants. And I wish you all a blessed day. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. I think that's a very good way of um, exchanging views, even if we don't agree, but we listen. And I think that's really, really important. So thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. I agree. And I take my hat off to you for, for doing such a stellar job of listening off to each other. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.